Good day, it's Dr. John Bennett broadcasting from Miami Beach for the home of Neurosurgical TV. We have uh, the pleasure of having Dr. Landry here uh, today to give a presentation and uh, this is actually a redo, but we're going to try to make it work because we finally figured out the sound. So anyways, uh, thank you Landry. Could you please introduce yourself and, uh, and just let me know when you want to start the PowerPoint. Okay, so I'm Landry Cannon. I am uh, working as a consultant assistant professor at the University of Felix Fouboigny in Abidjan. When I have a joint appointment at the Laboratory of Human Anatomy and at the Department of Neurosurgery. Okay. Uh, I got a master's degree, so master's degree in US 2018 in Human Anatomy. Okay. Okay, you want me to start the PowerPoint? Yeah, let's okay. do it. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Let me get to the, you imagine you want to start at the beginning here. I think the first nine uh, slides are good. Okay. Okay. Can you see it okay? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You can begin. Okay, so uh, let's go to the next slide. As an introduction, this is um, the transfinoid approach is um, is a very, a very hard approach. So one of my master just remind me that Egyptian used to to dig a hole through the nose to suction the brain in order to make the involvement. So a long time ago, people knew that you can get through the brain through the nose. Uh, so um, later on, we developed microscopic transfinal approach. And this is uh, something that we learned decades ago. And now people are using more and more the telescope, the endoscope. And these endoscope are the advantage to, uh, to give a panoramic view uh, while you're doing your cases. So the interest of this approach is that ENTs and skull-based neurosurgeon both perform this approach, and there are many centers where they, they both do uh, in the OR, like the ENT does the nasal phase, and the uh, neurosurgeon, they get in to do the sphenoid stage and onto to the uh, skull base. So the, this endonasal transphenoid approach give you a wide range of view of all the three stage of uh, three step of the skull base to give you an anterior view of the anterior uh, skull base, middle uh, skull base, and posterior skull base. So this is a hub where you can move your your uh, endoscope to resource uh, all kind of lesion, especially in the midline. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. So we will go to the anatomy. Um, and next to the indication, and we will take much more time to the surgical technique. Next. Okay, next, next slide, please. Okay, so this is a sagittal view of what we are going to talk about. You will introduce your endoscope. So the endoscopic is not endoscopic approach. This is just, the endoscope just move your eyes deep inside the view, inside your field. So uh, this is what we're going to talk about. Okay, next slide. Okay, so if you want to get comfortable you, uh, with this approach, you need to know at least the bony structures and then the mucosa and then how the, the blood get into the mucosa. So on the upper left, is the sagittal view on the midline or oh, different color are used to highlight different kind of bone that you will see at the cancellous uh, cartilaginous bone in orange the ethmoid bone in green and in red is the vomer bone those are what you will encounter during your approach through the nasal septum if you go forward Posteriorly, you will see the sphenoid bone, and mainly you will see the sphenoid sinus. That then you will get there to get to the anterior 
first as a panel training with dollies, the cellar, or the climbs. Down along the floor of the nasal fossa, you will see the mandible bone. So if you go laterally, uh, this is a picture that we see on the right. If you go laterally on the sagittal plane, you find those three turbinates that are really famous. So the inferior turbinate is uh, right and readily, uh, um, you can see readily when you introduce your endoscope. The inferior turbinate, and then up, you will find the middle turbinate, and up again, the superior or supreme turbinate. We don't talk much about this uh, supreme turbinate. Okay, so let's move forward. So you need to know the bone, but you need to know that when you do this approach, the mucosa will bleed. The mucosa bleed a lot, so you need to know where the blood comes from. It comes from three main sources. The three main um, arterial supply are on the top, the ophthalmic artery, anterior and posterior ophthalmic artery. And on the posterior lateral uh, side, you will find the senopalatine artery. So the senopalatine artery comes from the posterior side and you give a brain into the septum, nasal septum, and give another brain to uh, the lateral wall of the nasal fossa. That will be shown deep um, in the next slide. Okay, next. So the anatomy on the frontal side, you can see on this cut, you have in the middle the septum. You have uh, in TI is inferior turbinate, laterally inferior turbinate. Upward, you have the middle turbinate. And you are more laterally the uh, bulla ecmoidalis. That is really not, uh, really not, have to worry about when you're doing your midline approach. On the right picture is what you see is uh, uh, ethmoid bulla, and you see the relationship between the middle turbinate and the sinus, the maxillary sinus. So the ENTs they use this approach to get to the maxillary sinus too. But for us, uh, what you need really need to understand is how we have the disposition of the in inferior turbinate, middle turbinate. And laterally, the ethmoid bulla is something that you can just crush to make more room to displace laterally the middle turbinate without any consequences. Okay. Let's go forward. So that was a, a short video to help you identify the inferior turbinate, middle turbinate, Bula at Medalis. So if you should, okay. So the video is playing now. So this is a, a short video that we did in our anatomy lab. So when you get your endoscope, go down. Go down, you will find the floor. You find the floor laterally. So here is the a, a left nostril. So you see the middle turbinate. On the left, you see the nasal septum. If you go forward, and upward, you will see the middle turbinate, and laterally, you have the bulla et medalis. Laterally, you can crush this bone with your rongeur, and it will help you make more space to mobilize laterally the middle turbinate. Okay. So, if you you put laterally the middle turbinate, you have this corridor. This is uh, an important corridor. This is where you put your instrument to get to the Sphenoid bone and the sphenoid sinus. Okay, next slide, please. So this is again to show you the relationship between the middle turbinate and the bulla et medalis. It's just lateral, lateral to um, the middle turbinate. That's just what I want to show you here. So on the next uh, two right picture, you see how we can use a forceps. To just crush down the bullite medallis, it will give you more space to move laterally the middle turbinate. Next slide. So once you once you introduce your endoscope, you have this view that we see on the left. The view is the nasal septum, 
and the inferior turbinate. So this is the right nostril. You have medially the nasal septum, and laterally the inferior turbinate. And you move along the floor, you move your endoscope along the floor, you will find the picture on the right. Is that when you go along with your endoscope, you will find the posterior rhinopharynx that you see here on CO. And then upward, you find the middle turbinate. So for me, the CO that you see here, you will see the, the CO have, a, have the shape of an arc. So this arc is the lower margin of the sphenoethmoidal recess. And for me, this is the main landmark. Easy to find, and this will give you the entrance to the sinus. Let's move forward. Slide. Okay. So this is the same view um, in more detail, in more magnified view. The inferior turbinate laterally, the middle turbinate upward. So um, you have medially to the middle turbinate is the sphenoethmoidal recess. So the sphenoethmoidal recess, you should bear in mind that this is the entrance of, of your sphenoid sinus. If you remove the mucosa, if you remove the, you drill off the, the bone, you get into the sphenoid sinus, straight. Okay. So uh, the picture on the, on the right, again, this is the right nostril. You see the inferior uh, margin in the uh, shape of an arc, and on, above it is a sphenoethmoidal recess. You cannot miss it. You just move your endoscope forward, uh, deep down, you will, you will find it. Okay, next slide. Again, this is your, the relationship. People, when they do this approach, they are looking for the, SMO, the ostium of the sphenoid sinus. So if you see the lower margin, now I'm commenting the picture on the left. So you have CO here is the arch, the lower margin of the sphenoethmoidal recess. You see the lower margin, you go about one and a half centimeter upward, you will find your, your ostium there. So if you find your ostium there, this sphenoethmoidal recess is again, what uh, you will find is where you will find the sphenopalatine artery. So if you find the ostium upward, you can go there, you, you, you just widen the aperture, it will help you to get through the sphenoid bone. But if you are from this ostium and you go like one centimeter below, you find the sphenopalatine artery and we start bleeding. So usually I don't make any incision there. I will rather, I will put, I will make my incision on the nasal septum and move laterally the mucosa to reflect a pedicle flap with the sphenopalatine artery inside. So the picture on the, on the right, again, we show you this um, sphenoid ostium here. So you see the relationship with the sphenoethmoidal recess and the sphenoid ostium upward. Sometimes the sphenoid ostium is just recovered by the mucosa. So just, just you use your suction and you palpate smoothly and then you will get, when you go upward, you will get through this ostium easily. Okay, next slide. Okay, this is a coronal view that help you to understand uh, the, the arc that I'll show you. Both arc will make a kind of M letters. So when you see those arc, the sphenoethmoidal research, lower margin, you should understand that just after that, you will get into the sphenoid sinus. And when you get into the sphenoid sinus, you should understand that laterally are uh, the ICA, the cavernous sinus, V1, V2, and all those nerves that you, you will find laterally. But this is not, uh, this is just something that you have to bear in your mind. Okay, so next. Okay. Here again, I want to show you uh, the trajectory of the sphenopalatine artery. So here again, 
uh, this is the right nostril. So you see in red that the sphenopalatine artery are located between the inferior margin of the sphenoethmoidal recess and the ostium upward. So in the middle, at mid distance between them, you will have the sphenopalatine artery running within the mucosa. You will make, you will give up branches that will supply the nasal septum. Okay, next slide. So you should also understand that the pneumatization of the sphenoid bone is different and can vary from patient to patient. So usually what we find is in 75%, we have what we call the cellar type of the mucosa. And in 24%, you will find a pre-cellar sinus. And uh, in just 1%, it's really not pneumatized is just what we call the concal um, bone, the concal sphenoid bone. It's not well pneumatized. Okay, next slide. Okay, so when you get in inside the sphenoid sinus, you should look for those landmarks. So the CP, no, so the first land, uh, the first uh, landmark that you should see is uh, the floor of the cellar. Here the floor is removed, and you see DM here just means dura matter. So the dura. So when you see this cellar floor, below the cellar floor is a clivus. Above the cellar floor, in the midline, is the uh, planum, planum sphenoidale. Laterally to the planum sphenoidale, you have the opt preeminence. And laterally to the cellar, you have the carotid prominence. Between the carotid prominence and the optic prominence, you have what you call the optocarotid uh, fossa of the optocarotid recess that you see, OCR. Opto for the optic nerve and carotid, optocarotid recess. So you should always look for this. And as I mentioned earlier, if you get this view, you should look for the rostrum again. So you remove, uh, you move uh, your endoscope a little bit backward in order to find the, the rostrum because the rostrum is what we show you the midline. Don't look, don't trust the intra, intra sphenoid septum because it's not gonna show you the midline. Look for the rostrum. So you should leave a little piece of bone on the rostrum that we always show you where is the midline. If you stay on the midline, you will not injure the high seal. So this is the main message on this uh, slide. Next. Okay. So again, on the left, you see that um, you have the, on PG is the pituitary gland. So that shows you the relationship between the pituitary gland and the ICA and the clivus. So ICA, first, when you get to the sphenoid bone, it will run upward, make a major loop, and then go forward to make a lateral loop, and go backward again to get to the paraclinoid ICA. So usually, the most uh, vulnerable part of the ICA during this approach is the major loop that you see. Yeah, the major loop is the closest part of the ICA to the pituitary gland. And uh, when you see the picture on the right, just to show you that if you drill, when you continue drilling below the pituitary gland, you drill the clivus, you remove the dura, you get right in front of the basilar artery. Virtually, this is something that you can do if you want to get to an aneurysm that is located at the basilar tip, but it's not comfortable to do that. So just to show you, if you go forward, this is where you go. But again, when I put my endoscope, I don't look, I, I go down first, because if you go down first and you get into the sphenoid uh, sinus, you will have a bunch of bone to drill before getting to the basilar artery. So it gives you much more time to realize that they are going wrong. But if you go upward, too upward, and you miss the pituitary gland, and you drill a little bit, 
the shin shell that makes the planum sinoidale. You will make an incision there and bam, you have CSF links. This is too upward. So it's better to go downward and identify upward the pituitary gland. Okay, next. So the CT scan for each patient is valuable. You should look for the septum that you find inside the sinus because this will, will delineate compartment. If you don't analyze well, you may get into a small compartment and you think that you are inside the wall uh, uh, sinus. And if you think that you're inside the wall sinus, you will get, usually you go laterally and this is how you can injure ICU and uh, have a bleeding, usually bleeding, sometimes can be fatal. Usually here in Africa when you don't have interventional uh, procedure. So you should look and study carefully the septum inside. And then if you go in the midline, like making the nasal septal flap, you get in the midline and you can easily manage those septum and avoid to go too laterally. Next slide. Okay, the indication. Indication is what we see here. You, uh, um, the most famous indication is pituitary adenoma followed by craniopharyngioma. But we can have all those indications. Let's go forward. Okay, this is just a case that we, we, we did recently in our um, hospital. Just here to show you that you really need to, to, to look in the middle, you see that you have the cellar type of uh, sphenoid sinus. Okay. And you see on, uh, on the right, you see how it is located, surrounded, and it's really medial. So when it's in the midline, you are pretty sure that you can have it. And inside, you don't see septa there. This is important to see on the coronal view. Okay, let's go for the next slide. Okay. Next, next slide. Okay, so let's go to the most practical part of this presentation. People, when they think about an, an endoscopy, they think about the screen, they, see, they think about the telescope. So that's what we see on the, right, on the right part. At the end, you see screen, you see the telescope, and then you say, okay, I will look at the screen. But you, you need to be aware of how to, to connect everything, how to connect everything. So first, you go, we go from the, from the left to go to the right. So first, you need to have a power supply. And then the power supply will connect the camera console to um, the electricity. This console will be connected to the camera. I will show you a picture of the camera. And the camera, is connected to the telescope. The light cable is also connected to the telescope. And so the light cable have a light source that is, that is again, connected to the power supply. So you should always uh, know how to mount because you sh should not uh, rely always on the technician in the OI. You should understand how it works. So this is a co connectivity that you should uh, understand. And for the telescope, you can have zero, 12 degree, 30 degree, 45 degree, 70 degrees. Everyone has his own advantage and limitation. Okay, let's go forward. Slide. Okay, so this is just a picture on eBay uh, because most of uh, my fellows, they just ask, oh, maybe it's really expensive to get those equipment I want to do this approach, but I don't have money. Uh, you know, when we go to um, some stores, it's really expensive. You can go on eBay and you find the telescope for less than $300 and it works. Really, it works nice. All you need to know is that you need to have a four millimeter diameters and one, at least 175 millimeter long. And this is right for you. You can use it to do your, uh, your cases. So here on eBay, you can find it. Next. Okay, so this is a camera I was talking about. So there are different kinds of cameras. So this is a camera, and the camera is connected to the camera console. So that's it. And the console 
will be connected to the power supply. So here is a traditional kind of, of uh, endoscope camera, and these are some new kind of camera that doesn't have wires, but I really trust wires more. And you can find it on eBay for, let's say, 500 or less, $500, US dollars. Okay, let's go again. Go ahead. Yes, next slide. Okay, so for um, this approach, people will ask again, what kind of uh, instrument I can get? You can again go on eBay for about six, 650 US dollars. You can go, you just type FES, like functional um, um, endoscopic sinus surgery. And you can get those instruments, and this is around the price. So for, let's say, on total, for around $2,000, you can have your equipment here in, and to practice in Africa. Okay, let's go ahead. So now we go to the main instrument that you need to know. So those are the elevator that, for me, as a um, masterpiece instrument that you need to have for your approach. So on here, the, the picture A here is a different type of elevator. You use those elevators to dissect away the mucosa. When you get there, I will show you the step, but this is really important that you will use it a lot. If you don't have this, basically uh, you, you cannot perform the approach. So the punches you see on the right, you will use uh, like 45 degree up or 45 degree down it will help you to um, increase your aperture. When you, uh, you remove the bone of the, the rostrum, you need uh, those kind of rongeurs. Okay, let's go again, next. Okay, so um, the, as I said, the elevator, the rongeur, and the suction cannula are those that you will use on the nasal stage on the nasal stage, when you get in, into the nose, before going to the sinusoidal, these are the core instruments that you will use. And here are some um, dimensions that you can just memorize and buy it. Again, next slide. Next slide. Okay. Again, here you can have uh, those uh, biopsy forceps that you will use to mobilize your Another set of flap, for, for example, there are scissors there that you can use to cut your nasal septal flap. I will talk about the nasal septal flap later on this presentation. And on the top here, uh, on the picture C, on the, on the top here is the drill. It's not, it's not uh, always necessary. Initially, when we start with microscopic approach, we didn't use this drill. We just had a chisel and uh, and my mallet that we use, a chisel and the mallet was fine to open the, the rostrum. But it, now you can use a drill. It's much more uh, uh, efficient. Let's go ahead, next slide. Next slide. I can't see the slide now. You can't see this. Okay, yeah. you can't see that slide, no? Can you see that slide? I, I don't see slide. No, okay. no, no one sees the slide. Can you see the slide or no? Yes, we can see. We can, we can see. see. Yeah, you can't see the slide, uh, Landry. Okay, okay, I can see the slide now. Oh, okay. okay. Wow, that's a, that's a conundrum. Oh, what is that? What does conundrum mean? I don't. I, well, geez, we can see the slide, oh. but you can't. Uh, okay, how can we? I, I, I see, I see the slide now. Okay. okay, okay, okay. So as I said, you, usually the first step is that you will you will explore the nasal uh, the nasal floor. You explore the nasal, and then you will you you will need to incise the mucosa. So on the on the right are different type of blade that you can use, and I really like using the twelve blade because I can turn it upward, downward, and it, it's really nice. It's better than the 15 blade. Okay, next. Next. 
Okay. So once you make your incision, you, you, you need those kind of scissor in order to, to continue uh, making your cut to make the nasocetal flap. Again, next slide. Next. So the cannula is the same, the section uh, cannula is the same. Next. Okay, so now we are uh, in the sphenoid uh, stage. So when we, we incise the mucosa, we put it laterally, we are in the, in the sphenoid sinus, those kind of forceps is what we, we, we use to remove the mucosa. It's essential to remove the mucosa, to remove the, uh, all the septum that you can see inside. Next. And then, when you finish removing that, sometimes um, the mucosa can be really hard to mobilize and to remove. So you can do, use those RD ring correct to help you get off the mucosa and remove. But mainly this is, uh, is used for the cellar stage. Once you open the floor of the cellar, once you, you uh, transect the dura of the cellar floor, you use those RD correct. This is gentle. And so you use it to remove the adenoma, the uh, pituitary adenoma, for example. Okay, next. Okay. Sometimes the adenoma can be fibrous, or sometimes you can deal with craniopharyngioma. So those kind of scissors that is curved to the right, curved to the left, uh, you can use it. And this is, you need to really uh, be used to it because as we mentioned earlier, you have the carotid on both sides. So you really need to understand before making any kind of cut. Okay, but this is really nice when you want to deal with um, removing craniopharyngioma, for example. Okay, next. Next. Okay, so let's go to the operating room. Usually what, what we do here is that we, we start cleaning the nasal fossa using um, iodine solution. You can use iodine solution or any other kind of antiseptic agent, but usually this is what we use. Iodine, the green, the green one is what we use. We rinse, we clean the nasal fossa several times. We put um, uh, the antiseptic inside and we, we suction it on the overhand. We do it for at least five, 10 minutes. Okay, so here again, um, I want to talk about installing the patient. So in different, in different practice, people to, uh, make a flexion, like 15 degree flexion uh, of the head. Some people, they just uh, put the patient lie flat, but all depend on um, the way you will, uh, you will make, uh, you will insert your telescope. But usually what I do is just to put uh, the head 15 degree um, up forward in order to maximize the uh, venous drainage. Okay, next slide. Next slide. Um, okay. 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 Uh, so here is an again a view that uh, we used to see. So we. We um, make a flexion of the head about 15 degree, and we turn the, the, the head on the right, like we, uh, the patient is facing his surgeon. And usually we stay on the right side uh, to perform the surgery. Okay, next. Next. Next slide. Okay, so for the ergonomy, usually, Resident, they just go into the OR, they want to get the, the blade, and they don't think about where and when the surgeon is, where the assistant is, where the anesthesiologist will be. So this is really important for ergonomy. So usually this is a setting that we, we, we do. Okay, next. Okay, so usually what we prefer to do is to harvest the fat tissue. We harvest it before 
uh, going to the nasal stage. You get a lot of, usually this is the incision that we use to harvest the tissue. Next. We harvest uh, fat tissue usually for uh, the closure of pituitary adenoma cases. And in some instance, when we deal with, uh, with craniopharyngioma, what we do is we prefer to harvest on, on the thigh. Because here you can have both the fascia lata and you can have fat tissue. So you don't perform two incisions, you have both there. So this is just uh, the marking incision of where we use to get to the facial lata. Before getting there, we have fat tissue, so we harvest it and we go forward. Again, next slide. Uh, this is just a picture of uh, um, the facial lata that we harvest. This was the case of craniopharyngioma that we do, uh, we were uh, performing. Again, next. Okay, as I said again, we need to really understand how the middle turbinate and inferior turbinate are located. And this uh, narrow corridor between the nasal fossa and the turbinate, you need to expand it. You really need to expand it out and be more comfortable introducing your sanction, introducing your telescope, and again, another instrument. So um, on, on the regular practice, what we do is by nostril approach. Some people just, just prefer uh, mononostril, but we don't really see any significant difference. But it increases your comfort when you do um, binostral approach. Okay, again? Okay. Okay, so um, here is, uh, you see two different ways of putting your endoscope, your telescope. Either you go downward or even you go 45 degrees. So usually on the right, is where is where people is how people put uh, introduce the endoscope, but this way is really depending on the way you install your patient. If you install up your patient fifteen degree um, in a fifteen degree flexion, this is on the right how you in the, you introduce your um, telescope. But usually, when your patient is like is, is flat on the table. This is on the left, how you will introduce your endoscope. So my tip for people to, practice, to use this approach is, when you get through the nose, go down, go down first. Because when you go down, you see the nasal four, you see the inferior turbinate, you will see the sphenoethmoidal recess, always. And it's, it's really difficult for you to, to go through down and get to the, the brainstem is really difficult because you will have to drill, drill, drill all the bone. But it's really easy to misplace your endoscope and go straight to the ethmoid bone to the anterior uh, fossa. This is this is one of the common mistake. So you go down first. It's easy. It's safe. You see the the sinoethmoidal recess, and then you can go upward. Okay. Next slide. So zilokine nasazoline, this is what we have in our operating room. This is what we use. We soak the body in it and we put right between the nasal uh, septum and the middle turbinate. We put it there again, again, and again. We can put three parties there as much as possible. And we wait. We wait for five minutes. We take our time. We, we make jokes. And then... After five minutes, we remove our body, and we will see that it in increase. So uh, the picture on the on the right is where it's how we put our body. We put our body there between the nasal septum and medial turbinate, and we wait for five minutes, and bam, it's magic. You can just have a better expanded view, and you can go forward with your instrument. Okay, next, next. So at this stage, on the nas nasal stage, is when, if you want, depending on what kind of procedure that you do, you can, at this stage, harvest your nasal septal flap. So this is a sagittal view on the left, and this is an endoscopic view that you have on, on, your, on your right. So on your right, we are 
in um, right nostril. Okay, so there's a nasal septal cut. It's as shown here. You make a cut from backward to, to, for, to forward, from posterior to anterior. And then you go down. And for down, you go again backward. So you will have the flap that is, um, that is, is uh, vascularized by the sphenopalatine artery. And that way it's, uh, it's safe. So you take this flap, you move it, you mobilize it down into the posterior brainopharynx, and then you can put, continue your procedure. Next. Next. Okay, so this is an example, picture A. So picture A, if you can zoom in, you see that we have the sphenoethmoidal recess that you see RO, the sphenoethmoidal recess. So here is a, is a nest, is a left nostril, left. Picture A is a left nostril. So when you get there, you see the, as a lower margin of the sphenoethmoidal recess. This is where you make your, your cut. You make your cut there from backward to forward, from posterior to anterior. So you make your cut, your cut you go down and you go uh, anteriorly. And the picture B is the same thing. You, you move anteriorly with your knife. And then after that, you go upward. You go upward on the picture C. You go upward on the nasal septum. And then after you go backward and you, you make this. Okay, next slide. Okay, okay, next slide. This one was just to, to show you the, the view that you have when you wait for five minutes, uh, you left your, you leave your party there for five minutes and then you have this view, okay. Forward, next. Next slide, please. John. John. Hello. John. Next slide, please. Okay. Next slide, John. Okay, okay, okay. So here, um, the picture on the top left, it's a right nostril, right nostril. Uh, all, all those pictures are right nostril. So when you are on the right nostril, see the, the distance between the, the lower margin of the sphenoethmoidal recess. You see the lower margin where you see the letter CO. So from CO to SO, the um, sphenoidal ostium there, you have uh, you have this uh, in your mind that uh, the sphenopylatine artery will have this brain coming in the middle to go to the nasal septum. So this is a picture you see in the middle, okay? You have the mucosa, but bear in mind that the sphenopylatine artery are going inside the mucosa. Okay, so this is a message I want to show here. Next. Next, okay, those are... Again, the same view, inferior turbinate. As I say, when you put your endoscope, you go down, go down. Don't, don't hurry to go up, go down. You go down, you see the inferior turbinate, you see the middle turbinate. You go forward, you will see the picture B. So from A, you go to the picture B. It's by moving forward your endoscope, down, down along the floor, you will go straight to the posterior inopharynx. You will see the arc that makes the lower margin of the sphenoethmoidal recess. And from there, you go upward, you will see the middle turbinate. You go upward, if you wanna find the ostium, you get there. You go upward for about two centimeters. You put your, your section, you just palpate your, with your suction, and then you will get into the hole that is the ostium. Again, next. Next. Uh, no, okay. So once you are here, uh, look at the picture C. So the, the picture C here just show you how you make your incision. So you're free if you want to make the nasal septal flap, you do as I described previously, 
or you can just make a vertical incision down, up to down, and then you will move laterally the mucosa. If you do this, in, uh, you, do, you do it posteriorly. And then when you finish to, uh, to mobilize laterally, it will show you the osteum. And from your uh, ipsilateral osteum, you just move a little bit laterally for about one centimeter, you will get to the left osteum. From there, you do your posterior septectomy. And then you're in, in, inside your sphenoid sinus. Okay, next. Okay, so again, this is a picture showing you that, uh, so as you see the mucosa flap, the picture on the left, the mucosa flap, and then you will see uh, the cartilage, the septal cartilage, and then with your elevator, you go to the left nostril. Simple. So you do this, and you see the picture that you see you have on the B, on the right. Uh, people look like, uh, people describe it here like uh, the rostrum, of, uh, like a ship, a ship boat, or some people uh, describe like uh, what kind of animal, they call it uh, the hulu. Okay, so you, it's like two eyes. The osteum are like two eyes, and uh, the middle are like <laughs> another nose, kind of. Okay, so you have this view, you're all right and you can go forward. So what I want to show you again, another tip that I learned from my mistakes is that the picture on B grossly is like a, a diamond shape. A diamond shape where you can divide this diamond on an upper triangle and a lower triangle. Unfortunately, I didn't put a um, horizontal line to delineate those upper triangle and lower triangle. So if you, if when you have this view with the two osteum, again, it's like a diamond shape. So the inferior, uh, the inferior margin of the, of the inferior triangle is this is a lower margin of the sphenoethmoidal recess. This is an inferior margin. And on the upper triangle, you will see both osteum and you go on the top. So when you are in the middle of this diamond, you can move laterally as far, displace the mucosa as far as you can to expand your corridor. But if you see this diamond shape and you see that um, you're going on the upper triangle, so on the upper triangle, you cannot displace your mucosa laterally. You cannot because you're going to the ethmoid bone. So when, if you have this diamond shape, go straight, stay in the middle of those, uh, of these uh, diamond shape. Don't go upward. You go upward there, you will make your, your drilling, you get into the planar sinoidale, or you get into the ethmoid bone, you have a CSF leaks. And it, if you want to go to the cellar, don't go up. Stay in the middle, use your, like a horizontal line that join both osteum. Use it as your superior landmark. Don't go above it. You go above it, you get into the ethmoid bone, you get into the anterior uh, fossa, you get CSFD. Okay, so next slide. Next slide. Next. Not, not this one? Yeah, yeah, go next. I, I already uh, talked about, um, okay. So this is a view that you have. So on picture A hey, hey, here, you can use the drill as I show you among the instrument list, or you can use your rongeur or your forceps and you cut this. As I show you again on the picture B, you will see inside. So when you use this technique, on the picture A, just leave a little, a little piece of bone that will remind you the midline. You keep a little bit of bone. And if you look on the picture C, down you will see uh, the letter I, W, S, P, H, S. So here is a little piece of bone that shows the midline. Don't look 
Don't, don't look for the, the septum that you see in, into the sphenoid um, sinus. Don't look at it because it's not mid, the midline. The midline is what you see down there on picture C. This is the midline. This is what you should consider. It cannot fail you. Okay, so you go, you get into your sphenoid uh, sinus. You uh, try to recognize and identify the cell art, identify the optic prominence, the planar sphenoidale, both carotid prominence. And then remember the piece of the rustum that you leave will show you the midline. So this is the approach to get into um, the transphenoid root. From there, you can go to the clivus, you can go to the cella, you can go to the uh, anterior of fossa. Okay, next slide. Next slide, okay. So this is uh, the real, the real <laughs> field view. You have sometimes a lot of bleeding. So on picture A, as I show you here, here um, you have both because here is a deep a posterior septectomy that allows you to see both middle turbinate. So here, because they remove the posterior part of the nasal septum, you can see both middle turbinate. And you saw in, in, in the midline, you, can, you see straightforward. You see the rostrum that you see the kill. So this will show you the midline. So even if you go just above, you drill off, just keep a little piece of bone here. It shows you the midline. Okay, next. Again, this is what I, I was, I'm insisting, highlighting again on the picture on the right is this little shell of bone that you should keep to, to don't go too large. Only. Again, next slide. Okay, so when you are inside the mucosa, uh, when you're inside the sphenoid sinus, don't forget, remove the mucosa. You remove the mucosa, so you won't come back for mucosal surgery. You remove all, every, every mucosa that you see there. Again, next slide. Okay, so we're going to the end. Um, so what I wanna show you here, is the advantage and the limitation. So usually people, they use a zero degree endoscope. So it gives you a nice view above and below the scope. And if you want to do like craniopharyngioma surgery, or when you have a, a supracellar component of a pituitary adenoma, it's better to use an angle endoscope, like a 30 degree to 45 degree, sometimes to 70 degree. And so you rotate the endoscope. You rotate the endoscope, it helps you to have this panoramic view, depending on what you need, what kind of procedure you do. So usually, basically, for a pituitary adenoma, a zero degree is enough for you to get there. But when you do craniopharyngioma, you need to drill a little bit, a little bit the um, tubercle cellar. So you need to have an angle endoscope to be able to see uh, the optic chiasma and see above. Yeah, so this is the nuances that you have. But for me, sometimes I'm, I'm comfortable using a 30 degree endoscope because it allow me when I get into the nose to sit down, to sit down. I like to sit down, downward to see the floor. And then from there, I'm pretty sure that I will not go too, too high. Okay, next. Again, those are different type of harvesting. So you can do uh, like a small, like A or an extended nasal septal flap. And all these will help you to make the closure really easy to do. Okay, and usually that's what I do when I do craniopharyngioma. Okay, next. Okay, I think this is a video. I don't know. Can you we can, play we it? Can, yeah, we can try it. Why not? Okay. Yeah, uh, let's try it. Okay, let's try it. Um, go for... You can't hear that, right? Uh, 
do do you need the do you need the audio or can you no no i don't need the audio okay i don't need the audio okay oh, okay so okay oh that was a case i tried to to make a, a video from my own case but i think my computer is too slow for that but just this is a case that you can see on uh, on youtube um can you go forward on the video okay no no forward yeah. where do you want to go okay. yeah okay okay so here they show you how to out fractures the middle turbinate so here is a right nostril view so on the left is the middle turbinate on the right is the nasal septum so they expanding the um, the corridor here by using the party and so they go straight. Uh, this is a superior uh, turbine. Oh no, no. Okay, just skip this video. Let's go forward. Okay, you want to start the video? Yeah, yeah let's go forward. Okay. I think we are close to the end. Do you want me to go close to the end or? No, 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 this slide and we go, okay. So yeah, so um, here I just want to show you a picture uh, uh, just to, to mention that we can use this approach to go uh, for craniopharyngioma, to go for uh, extended approach to, to those supracellular um, lesion. Okay, next. Okay. So again, when you want to do, for example, extended approach, uh, you need to consider this angle the angle made by um, the pituitary stalk and the optic chiasm. So when this angle, as this is, I'm describing the, the picture on the left. So this angle, when this angle is too narrow, it's really hard to use this approach to get to, um, to do surgery for coronary pharyngioma. It's better to do transcranial approach. That's my point of view. But when this angle is wide enough, that means you have space between the optic chiasm and the, and the pituitary gland. So this space is where is what you use to get to the, to the corneal pharyngioma, for example. So this is a picture of a dissection I, I did um, years ago to show you this angle that I'm showing on the, on the right. This angle on the top, you'll see uh, the optic chiasm and the two optic nerves. Below, you see the pituitary stalk, and below the pituitary stalk is the pituitary, um, the pituitary gland. So this is this corridor that we use when we do cranial pharyngioma. So on the MRI, you can see whether this angle is too narrow or if this is uh, wide enough, because this is where you will put your uh, suction, all your instruments, suction, scissors, endoscope. Okay, next. Next okay, hold picture. On. I got it. I got it. Okay, so um, again, this is another view to help you understand where is the cella. Above the cella, you have the intercavernous sinus in blue. So let's focus on the picture on the on the right. So the uh, in, intercavernous sinus. Sometimes it bleeds a lot. So what? Uh, what uh, I do and what I, uh, my uh, suggestion is to coagulate it before making this, uh, transecting it. So you can make a cut above and a cut below and you use your bipolar to coagulate the sinus in the middle before transecting it. And when you transect this, it gives you this view that I show uh, when you have on top the optic chiasm Below, you have the pituitary gland, and right there, you have the pituitary stalk, and you can go either way of the pituitary stalk to remove the cranial pharyngeal. Okay, next slide. Next slide. Okay, so this is a view of a, a dissection that I did uh, years ago, where you can see the dip, that when you drill below the pituitary gland, you would go straight to the pond, and the basilar artery, you see there, you, see, you can see the third nerve. When you, go, you drill above uh, the pituitary gland, you will get into the optic chiasm. 
it involves the optic enhancement. You have the anterior communicating artery. So virtually, you can you can do aneurysm surgery for acom um, aneurysm through the um, endoscopic endonasal approach. But really, I don't think it's use, useful today. But this is a panoramic view that you can see on both sides. You have the ICA. Okay. So next slide. Okay. So for the closure, for the closure, what we do here, we don't usually have a, a fibrin glue. So we use facial lata, fat, surgery cell, and we use these um, urinary uh, catheter that we use to inflate the distal portion to make it stick together. Uh, usually this is enough. So this is on the right, the view that you have when you mobilize your nasal septal flap to put, uh, uh, to make the closure of the cellar floor. Okay, next slide. Okay, so yeah, so the complication you can have I see injuries if you go too laterally. If you don't look at the small piece of restroom that you left, you can have CSF leaks, uh, depending whether you, you get through the ethmoid bone or you were doing your uh, pituitary adenoma surgery and you open the diaphragm, you can have CSF leaks. You can have posterior epistaxis. This is because you injure the senopalatine arteries. And if you go too, too high, you can have uh, anosmia by uh, destroying the fiber of the olfactive nerve. On long term, you can have senation, you can have mucosal, or you can have chronic sinusitis. Okay. So the last slide, conclusion. I hope I didn't talk too much, but this is a beautiful approach. I really like it uh, to do. Um, 24 joma surgery or pituitary adenoma surgery. I think that a younger neurosurgeon, not my point of view, but I think that younger neurosurgeon would be very, very um, uh, comfortable using this approach because a lot of us, we, we, we are used to have video games at home. So it's, we are comfortable using our, our hand and looking at the TV. So I bet that this approach will be are more and more used by young neurosurgeon. Okay, so thank you. Oh, well, excellent. Uh, and I, I really appreciate persistence and we're able to get that. The last, yeah. I mean, <laughs> from, from the seventh slide on, which we're gonna edit by the way, it was, ex the sound was excellent. And, and I'm glad we okay. persisted because that seems to me, I'm not a neurosurgeon, but it seems to be a topic that a lot of residents wanna see, a lot of students wanna see. And perhaps Naru can can make a comment on that. Go ahead, Naru. Got on mute there. You're you're muted there. See, we're all getting to learn this platform, but we'll get better. Go ahead, oh, Naru. You're muted. <laughs> I don't know why we're having trouble with the mute uh, today. Do you ahead. hear me? Yes, we can. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, uh, Doctor Landry. It was a very nice presentation. I I done a lot of revision of about uh, surgical anatomy about this uh, transfinodal approach, and uh, I don't have anything to say. Just thank you, thank you very much uh, to share with us uh, your knowledge. Thank you very much. Okay, more comments, questions. I'm not going to ask you, Amiata. I'm not going to say a word. Thank you for persevering. Um, we really enjoyed yes. the presentation. It was very informative. The images were fabulous, and. Um, once you got on the cell phone, the sound was perfect. Thank you again. Yeah. I think next gonna, time we use it. Then. No, we're going to go back and re-edit that. And we're going to redo the first part, uh, Landry, OK? OK. And later, after. OK. Um, see, more comments, questions from anybody? Or just to say hi to Dr. Uh, Dr. Landry? Yeah. Uh, Jen, I just go ahead, to Go ahead, Natalie. I just want to say thank you to Dr. Landry for the presentation. We look forward that you should present in our sessions next time. I also wanted to say that Dr. Landry is our mentor in, uh, and my teacher in, uh, in Ivory Coast. So he's a very good mentor, very attentionate. He even helps me present some, some of my techniques that I presented earlier. 
I also want to begin to thank him for being a member now, or a coach, or a mentor of AFA and Sue, on behalf of Eric and myself and all the other members. Uh, but I, ha I have a question, just a little question. Sure. Uh, the, you said uh, the sphenopalat, the sphenopalatine artery is uh, one of the arteries that disturbs you a lot during surgery, uh, during the nasal approach. So I just wanted to ask if it is injured, is there a major consequence or we can just pass over it? Well, there are not major consequences. For example, if you want to do a laser set or flap and you injure the part and artery, there is a main trunk and there are branches. So when it's just branches, it's okay. But if it's the main trunk, I mean, you will have an ischemia of your flap. This is what you should look for. But usually you can ligate it when it's bleeding. And this is usually what uh, ENTs do when they have uh, like huge epitaxis, epistaxis. They go inside, they locate, it's, uh, the main trunk is just uh, lateral to the attachment of the middle turbinate. So you go there and you can coagulate the uh, sinopalatine artery without any consequences. Oh, okay. Because the art I told you, you have the anterior ethmoidal artery, posterior ethmoidal artery that gives the blood supply to the middle cell. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Doctor. Then I have a question, another question. It was just an imagination. Has there ever been a case of uh, brain herniation through the through the hole that has been done at the at the at the at the sphenoidal uh, Says. No, no, no. You, if you're doing cellar approach, is what you can have because if you remove a pituitary adenoma, for example, mm -hmm. uh, what you can have is you have just on the top, you have the, the opticiasm. So mm -hmm. you can, opticiasm can fall, can, can you know go down, and you can have some uh, visual disturbance. This is something okay. you can have. So usually, when we what we do is when we remove the, the, the adenoma, we take the fat tissue that I show you how to harvest. So you take mm -hmm. the fat tissue and you put a little bit. Don't put too much because you will make another tumor there. Oh, okay. Just a little bit to avoid this fall down of the optic chiasm side. But uh, you, you, know, you should know that on, on the top of the pituitary gland, you have the pituitary stalk. And the pituitary mm -hmm. stalk is surrounded by the Jaffran cellar. Okay. So in order to have a brain herniation, brain okay. the brain, it, it's really difficult. It's okay. usually the optic carcin that can fall down. Okay. Then uh, one of on one of your last slide, you said um, sometimes you you may you may coagulate the the, the cavernous sinus. Oh, intercavernous uh, intercavernous sinus. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, is, is there no risk? Is there no um, is there no utility of that part that may um, endanger or give other uh, other complications? No, no, there are no risk. You know, um, on either side of the pituitary gland, you have the cavernous sinus. Okay, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. there is a venous circulation surrounding anteriorly and posteriorly the pituitary gland. So it just connect both cavernous sinus. Huh? This intercavernous uh, sinus just connect both cavernous sinus. So you can just coagulate. It will, it will not have any injuries. But if you don't coagulate, for example, you don't coagulate, you can have a lot of bleeding. And I remember one of my very first case that I was observing as a resident, the patient actually died. There were a lot of bleeding, and uh, we were not able to coagulate on time. And the infarctment is a patient to die. So, so what I suggest is to coagulate before transecting. So you make a cut above, you make a cut below, and you coagulate if you bipolar. And even if you coagulate, you transect, and it's still bleeding, you can use your bipolar and coagulate it. There are no risks. OK. Uh, once more, thank you, Dr. Landry, for persevering. It was really interesting, as you said last uh, time. Very interesting. Too much frustrating you. if I had to, to, to postpone again. So. <laughs> no, I'm happy that I, I could work today. 
Okay, very good. Any more comments, questions from the panelists? This is your chance to, to not only meet uh, Dr. Landry, but to meet the rest of the panel. It's okay with time. Okay, Dr. Bennett. Okay, are you, uh, anything to say, or you just want to say goodbye, Dr. Kabulo? No, I have a, a small question. <laughs> oh yeah, go ahead. We have plenty of time. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Landry, for that brilliant presentation. I really enjoyed your presentation. So I have two questions. The first one: what are what are the contraindications of that approach? Uh, when do you not do that approach? And um, the second one is, uh, do you also sometimes do the combined one? You do uh, open craniotomy and combine to the endoscopic uh, transphenoid. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, obviously, if you ask me what are the contraindications, I would say usually indication first are uh, tumors that are in the midline. Okay. Usually we use this approach as I said, for the anterior um, force, I like uh, tuberculum cellular meningioma, for example, or you can use it for a pituitary adenoma, corneopharyngioma. But when should, you should not do it is when the lesion go beyond the midline. If, you, if it goes, uh, um, let's say, too laterally, too upward, it's, it's not a real contraindication, but it's just that you will not be able to remove all the tumors. You will be able to remove tumors that are in the midlines, but extending the midline, you will not be able to do it. So usually when you have those cases, you do two stages. You do the first stage uh, endonasal, and then after you do a uh, transperineal to the middle. I don't know if I, uh, I miss, uh, answer your question, but um, sometimes, Sometimes you can open the cella and you find that the tumor is really fibrous. So when it's really fibrous, you, you have the choice to make some cut with the scissors. That's something I don't do because I'm very afraid of the ICA. So usually when it's really fibrous, I cannot remove it. What I do is I, I close the case and I do again to the transcranial approach. Okay. Very good. Uh, other comments, questions from the panel? I may agree with uh, what you say, uh, Dr. Landry. Uh, of course, uh, if you have uh, cases, uh, like example also when you don't have good uh, sinus and you know that it will be difficult to, to, uh, to, 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 to make that your approach, it is not that you should uh, to, uh, up, uh, up, up approach. And also, I don't know, uh, Dr. Landry, if you have experience about the paraceptal approach in the cases um, of uh, meningioma, uh, uh, clinoid uh, meningioma, or cordoma, if you have cases, uh, if you perform paraceptal approach. Well, I, I don't do that. So far, I don't do that. I'm, um, I'm very comfortable with midline lesions, midline. Okay. okay? Because, you know, in our context, you don't have fibrin glue, you just have sigicel, you see? So when you go laterally, you have the cavernous sinus, you can encounter bleeding, you don't have a hemostatic agent. So <laughs> for now, I don't, I don't do that. When I will have fibrin glue in a commonly uh, um, basis available in the country, then I will start doing this kind. Okay. For cordomas, it's really rare. I didn't have uh, the opportunity to do those. So okay. for um, for clinoid meningioma, I think that meningioma intracranial lesion. So I prefer to approach it intracranially. Intracranial. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. And yes. nice also to meet you. It is the first time I I see you. I don't know. Maybe I meet you for. Uh, Congress or something like that, but um, uh, nice to meet you and uh, I really enjoy your, your presentation. It is master's class. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I, I saw some of your presentation before. I'm, I'm really oh. impressed by the way you 
you are willing to, to give more of what you learn. And usually, if you are able to explain something, that means you understand. So, yeah, I'm very impressed by you, and uh, I wish you the best for your career. Thank you very much. Thank you very by much. the way, we have an, another really? lab here in Abidjan, so you are very welcome to come anytime after the COVID-19. Yes. Uh, you can come, and we will have a, a fun time dissecting uh, yes, learning thank you very much. in our anatomy lab. Thank you. Nice. Hey, Jen. I just wanted to uh, present another uh, one, another of our mentors and teachers for some yeah, experience. Great. She's just, uh, I don't know if she can present herself. Uh, professor, please can present yourself. The only female professor in, in Abidjan. So, yeah, it is yes, our uh, professor. Of, uh, of yeah, color. Professor Boale. She's our yeah. mentor. She, yeah. She's our mentor. Yeah, <laughs> Welcome okay. to Professor Boale. I, uh, okay. Okay. Uh, Go uh, ahead. Go hello, ahead. Everybody. Hello. <laughs> hello. Um, I want to congratulate uh, Dr. Landry for his nice presentation. Thank I, you. I have, uh, I have uh, I, I, uh, <laughs> my English is no so good, but I want to congratulate him and tell him that it was a very good. Uh, a very a very nice presentation. Thank you for uh, Thank you, your conference. It, it, uh, it, will, uh, it was very good. Thank, Thank you. you, professor. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> My English not so good. Eh? No, no, we're gonna we're going to have these in French. We're going to have them. Yeah, we're going to have them in French too. Thank you, thank no, you, Dr. Kuna. Thank you, uh, everybody, for this um, uh, this uh, uh, conference. Video can, conference. <laughs> well, for me? well, you know, Landry, we can do these in French. Also, we can do presentations in French. Uh, ah, if, oh, if, if any, know. if any of you want to in the future, Nauru, mm -hmm. if you want to do them in French, okay, no problem. We'll do them no in problem, French. No problem. We'll, we'll no do problem. them in French. We'll okay, do them in French. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. I, 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 okay. We're going to end this, and, and uh, we'll end this, and I'm going to I'm going to actually uh, edit the video so that we fix the first part of it. You know, the first part was horror show. <laughs> oh yeah. Jim, anyway, Jim? Uh, yeah, the land Do you want to? Let's go back and do the first like six minutes, okay? We can read yeah. okay. it. Yeah, we can read it. Yeah. John, please, there's a question from Kennedy to so Dr. Landry. Okay. He was, he's asking if uh, if Dr. Landry has ever gone for a tuberculum selling minion geoma with this approach. Well, well for now, for now, I didn't perform this approach. It's um, mainly due to the lack of instrument. As I as I said. You you need to have uh, uh, you need to have uh, let's say scissors, nice scissors to be able to dissect the tumor. You need to have a hemostatic agent. You need to have a material for the closure. For me, if you remove the bony structure of the anterior fossa, you need to have some kind of bony-like material to close it. You know, but we on a regular basis we don't have it. That's why I don't I don't try. Maybe when I will have a kind of gasket closure or kind of implant that like mesh implant, but I don't have material for the closure. This is why I didn't try it yet. Okay, okay. He has a second question. He said, in view of it being fibrous and a risk of tagging, uh, he had a spinoidal. In view of it. Being uh, fibrous or risk of tagging, why not use the uh, why not use the approach? Oh, okay. He said he answered that already. Okay, it's okay. I think this question is ended. Thank you. Okay, yeah, I'm just putting this together now. Uh, okay. Okay, yeah, yeah. We'll just we'll just. Uh, and all you guys, well, we're off the air actually now. I'm, I'm going to stop recording this right now. And 